Let me start by appreciating the Chamber of Commerce and Industry for putting all this together. It is all, not always the possibility that you'll get a critical mass of businessmen uh, leaving their course to come and congregate at a function like this. So to the Chamber of Commerce, to the Chamber of Commerce uh, through Mr. Ken Unditi, we owe you a great debt of gratitude for the same. In equal measure, let me also appreciate the efforts and hard work of the Nyanza International Investment Conference uh, organizing committee, led by Jeff, the chairman, and uh, Charles Nyachai, both very <coughs> close friends of mine for over 30 years, who have managed to put this together. And they are working with a critical mass of professionals from this region, people who have come out, out of their own volition to give back to the society, to the Nyanza community, by way of their technical expertise informed by their professional backgrounds. This conference is good people is being organized by professionals in various disciplines. People who are well-known authorities in their functional domains. And again, through the chair and the vice chair, I really want to extend our gratitude to them for bringing us this far. In terms of rationale for organizing the Nyanza International Conference, sometime back, almost a year ago, I did reach out to these professionals and ask them one question. Why is it that we have got professionals from Nyanza who don't want to soil their hands in the development agenda and are leaving everything to the county government and the national government? Yeah? Granted, it is not the business of government to compete in business with business. The business of government is to create an enabling environment for the private sector to exploit their full potential by way of enabling policies, laws, and regulations. There are critical development initiatives which have to be undertaken by the national government and the county governments in equal measure. But there is also our own contributing component in our individual capacities as private sector citizens and private sector players. All you guys seated here have got wide networks. We can leverage on those networks to facilitate optimal exploitation of the economic potential of Nyanza as a region. And that is why we have organized this conference, that instead of leaving everything for the national and the county governments, let us come in as professionals from Nyanza, as agents of necessity, to facilitate a, a, a forum, a thought leadership platform, where we can engage with private sector investors, tell them the opportunities that we have, informed by comparative advantages of the Nyanza region. And let us see if through public-private partnership, we are able to pursue our development agenda to a logical conclusion. That is the rationale and justification for organizing the Nyanza International Investment Conference. And I'm glad to report that when I reached out to His Excellency the President, because he's very, very passionate about the development agenda of this region, he readily accepted to officially open the conference on the 28th of this month <laughs> and also be a keynote speaker and chief guest at the very conference. <laughs> Courtesy of that acceptance, I've also reached out to an integral stakeholder base within government to support us in this initiative. I've facilitated meetings between the organizing committee and virtually anybody and everybody whose contribution will be invaluable in this process. They have met all the PSS they wanted to meet. They have met all the CEOs of the parastatals that they wanted to meet. Yeah? But also, it is important that this process becomes as inclusive and as participatory as possible. None of us here, starting with yours truly, has got exclusivity of ideas. So we want to bring on board everybody and everybody who can contribute towards the development agenda 
of Janza. And that is why we are reaching out to the integral stakeholder segment, so that no single stakeholder segment feels left out. It is in the same vein that we have convened this meeting today. You cannot be discussing the development agenda of Nyanza and you are leaving the business community behind. Yeah? Because you are the ones who are the owners of capital. Yeah? You are the ones who are the owners of capital in this region. So we can't leave you behind. Equally, you have got wide networks. The same, same private sector players we are talking about. Either locally or internationally, you have got a critical mass of friends in the private sector who can help and augment our efforts in development of Janza. And please, we want you over and above registering as delegates. We want you guys, because you run various business enterprises, please also get exhibition booths so that you can showcase. This is a platform through which you can showcase your products and services and goods but also tag along your friends in the private sector who can, based on their expectations and aspirations, match the development opportunities in Nyanza. Tag them along to the conference. We have managed so far to engage quite a number of integral groups. Uh, about one week ago, I led this organizing committee to a meeting with the European Union. And we had a meeting with a whopping over 30 EU ambassadors who have promised to bring on board investors from their respective countries to the conference, okay? In equal measure, subsequent to this meeting, we are going to next week meet all the other integral stakeholder segments from Nyanza. We don't want anybody to feel left out. We have no reason to exclude anybody. In fact, one time I told this organizing committee about two months ago that you people, one of the challenges we face in Nyanza is that any, in any initiative where we are involved, we don't want anybody who is better than us in that same space to get involved. This time round, we don't want to anybody to be left what? Behind. And therefore, next week, again, we have lined up various meetings with the integral stakeholder segments. On uh, Wednesday, we are meeting engineers and architects and anybody and everybody who is involved in the construction industry. On Thursday, we are having a working breakfast with all doctors. On Friday, we are having a meeting with uh, all lawyers from Nyanza, a meeting with the president of the Law Society of Kenya, Faith Odiambo, and she's already communicated with all the lawyers. We don't want to leave anybody behind and we are still open to suggestions. The subsequent week, we are going to have a meeting, a virtual meeting with Nyanza residents who are domiciled in the diaspora, so that they can also leverage on their networks out there and bring them to the what? To the conference. So that is the direction and approach that we are taking. We don't want to leave anybody out. I also want to mention that I'm participating in this process as one of the co-patrons of the Nyanza Professional Forum, <laughs> under whose uh, auspices this conference is being organized. The other co-patron is CS Ezekiel Machogu. He was not able to be with us here today. He's been part and parcel of the planning from the very, very onset, and you'll see more of him moving forward, starting with those meetings also next week up to the, and including the conference itself. I want now, uh, good people, if you allow me, just to espouse to you some of the major government initiatives that the Kenya Kwanzaa government, under the leadership and tutelage of His Excellency the President, is putting in place to create an enabling environment for the business community in this region. I'll start with fishing. And I'm very happy with the, the work that has been done by Victory, Victory, is it Victory Farms? Yeah, we were there with the president some time back and it is amazing what these people have, 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 have done. And Caesar, uh, please, this is something that is discussed at various levels of government, how the private sector can turn around a whole thematic area within our economic setup. In the fishing industry, 
because this region informed by comparative advantage, the blue economy is a major source of comparative advantage. The government has rolled out several initiatives. In our very first cabinet, which William Ruto chaired as president, he assented to a major fish training institute in this region. That is the Cabonio Fish Training Institute. It has already been commissioned. All the procurement issues of contractor and ETC have already been done. Is now going to be rolled out at a whopping 3 billion Kenya shillings. That is no mean achievement, and we will need, really need to lord the government for this. But again, somebody did mention that it is mind boggling, actually embarrassing, that we have fish from the lake here, but we are still eating fish from China. Yeah? What has gone wrong? What has gone wrong? Those are the questions that we need not just to ask ourselves, but also come up with strategic responses to some of the challenges in that space. Yeah? The government is already rolling out fish landing site to sort out the refrigeration problem that fishermen are facing. And along all our major beaches, starting from Usenga Edisiaya, which loom, Luanda Kutieno, Assembo Bay, yeah? Kindu Bay, Homa Bay, all the way down to Mehur, we are going to have fish landing sites. Quite a number of them are already working in progress. We will have fish landing sites in all those uh, beaches. But again, we want to partner also with the private sector. It's a major initiative in this space of aquaculture and even set up fish processing plants around the lake here. Why should we be getting fish from here and then going all the way to Thika to process it there? What's wrong with us? Yeah, and yet we also have capital here, okay? Please, let's work together in this space of fishing. And I believe at the tail end of the conference, we should have some tangible, tangible uh, agreement signed between businessmen from here and other private sector players so that at least we can also get the private sector to set up fish processing plants. In agriculture, you are aware that Kenyans have been complaining about the cost of living. Good people, 55% of the cost of living emanates from the cost of food. Yeah? But in the same vein, the cost of food is a function of the cost of inputs. And that's where we should start from. That's why as government we have drastically yeah, moved with speed to drastically reduce the cost of farm inputs. Starting with Fertilizer. When we came into government, fertilizer was going for a whopping 6,500 per 50 kilogram bag. Today it's at 50 shillings. <coughs> seeds, provision of seeds to, to farmers. Yeah? Just to mention but a few. But a major intervention which the government has put in place is the sorting out of the farmers' payment areas. This has been a historical problem and a challenge. At some point it appeared insurmountable. But as we speak, the government has sorted out all the farmers' payment areas. But moving forward, the plan that we have is to get the private sector to put in money in those sugar companies. Be it Chemelil, Muroni, Sony Sugar, Nzoya Sugar, or even Mumia Sugar for that matter. We are not selling those companies. They will not be sold, but they will be leased to private sector investors who can pump in money to revitalize those factories so that again one more time those factories can attain optimal capacity utilization levels. That is the direction that we are going. And the question that you should be asking yourselves is how do you participate in this process? I want us to start thinking big as businessmen from Nyanza. If we have got private sector investors, international investors coming in, how do you partner with them? Are we together good people? Those are the discussions that we need to be having among ourselves and with officials in government. In the area of tourism, Jeff aptly put it that tourism is another major thematic area. We have a lot of potential in this area. Within the lake, there is also religion as an opportunity for tourism. We have got several parks like the Rumah National Park, we have the mausoleums around here. There are a lot of opportunities within the Western tourism circuit. As we bring in investors, please see how to partner with these investors. Yeah? 
at times it is irritating that we bring in investors, but at the end of the day, you are not seeing anything tangible in the regions where these investors are <coughs> putting in money or the ventures. For example, I'll give you a case in point. Mining. Go to Makalda in Migori, or even Saradili or Wagoso in Siaya. The only performance indicator that some mining has been going on is big gapping holes, which are left unattended. There is nothing within the local communities to show you that gold has actually been mined from those areas. And that's why as government we are having a discussion as to how we can review the policies and laws so that in any area where gold is mined or any other mineral for that matter, a substantial proportion of the proceeds must go back, must be plowed back to the local community by way of tangible benefit. Yeah? That is something that we must do so that we don't have the investors also repatriating all the what? All the profits and nothing is plowed back into the local community. If you go to Homer Bay, there's a big potential for iron ore. And we can actually set up a steel manufacturing factory in Homer Bay, leveraging on iron ore as a local raw material within Homer Bay. So th there are major opportunities in that space as well. Infrastructure, starting with roads. The position of government is that all those roads which have stalled will be completed. So any money, little money that we get, within the harsh economic times, goes to paying contractors who are already engaged on those roads, and then they pursue those roads to a logical conclusion before we start new ones. But in areas where the economy, the economic potential of regions is locked because of roads, in those areas, deliberately and consciously and proactively, again, the government is going out of its way to start rolling out roads. A case in point is Mfangano Island. We have started a 53-kilometer road there. That is going to open up the island, OK? There's another one also in Rusinga. But there is one major road that is really going to open up the entire ecosystem of Nyanza and the western region. That is the Lake Victoria Ring Road. <coughs> this is something that has been in plan since time immemorial. As we speak, the Kenya National Highways Authority has redesigned that road. The Ministry of Infrastructure has already approved it and forwarded it to Treasury. Discussions are now going on between the National Treasury and the World Bank to finance that road. It emanates all the way from Busia, runs along the lake, up to the Kenya-Tanzania border. If that road is done, that single infrastructure project, it will open up the entire Nyanza region for purposes of entrepreneurship, trade, and commerce not just among ourselves, but also between the six counties of Nyanza and the wider Kenya, and also the entire East Africa region. That will be a major, major infrastructure intervention. And we are determined, uh, this government, to do that under this tenure, first tenure of William Ruto government. We also have major water projects still in the infrastructure space. But I want to just to talk about one. The dams. The Korusoin Dam has been in plan for quite a while. The model that was utilized to conceptualize that dam may not be sustainable because it envisaged that the entire funding is going to emanate from the national treasury. And that will take us a long time because they are competing financial interests. So what we have done as a government is to pursue the direction of public-private partnerships. Just last week, my CS colleague, Njeru, was in Indonesia. And he has already managed to identify a private sector player who is willing to put in money in the Koruso in Dam. The Kenya government <laughs> will put in its equal measure of what is coming from the private sector. So we are going to pursue PPP. If we do that single dam, it's going to sort out three major challenges. One is the perennial and historical flooding problem in Kado. That will be a thing of the past. Because during the heavy rains, we'll be plowing that water into the dam. The same water is what we will use for purposes of irrigation. And that is really going to support irrigation projects in this region, including but not limited to the rice farming. 
And then three, it will facilitate last mile connection of water to the, to the houses. And four, and most fundamentally, augment the, what is, uh, what is uh, the output of uh, the Sondu, the Sondu Miriu Dam, so that we can have sustainable electricity, yeah? last mile connectivity of electricity to our homesteads. In that same space, we already have last mile connectivity of electricity going on in about, about uh, nine, nine constituencies in Nyanza. And all those constituencies which had not been covered will be covered uh, through the new funding which was gotten by the Ministry of Energy. In the space of ICT, this, we have got an opportunity, my brothers and sisters, to revitalize the operations of all aspects of our economy while leveraging on ICT. Yeah? We are rolling out 100,000 kilometers of fiber optic cable. All your businesses as private sector players require ICT as an infrastructure. So we are determined as government. We are rolling out 100,000 kilometers of fiber optic cable over the past one year, we have done 11,000 kilometers. But now we are changing the model. Instead of digging trenches along the ground, which is taking a lot of time and also expensive, we are now going to leverage on the existing transmission lines of Kenya Power. We have already contracted Kenya Power. They are bringing on board 300 contractors of their existing contractors to help us fast track this. This will sort out the problem of vandalism it will also enable us drastically reduce the cost of rollout of the fiber from 2.3 million shillings per kilometer to 600,000 shillings per kilometer. Yeah? But I want you to look at the net effect. The implication here, good people, is that anywhere where there is an electricity transmission line, in equal measure, we are going to have a fiber line. Kenya Power has got 74,000 transformers all over the country. So we'll be able to terminate the, 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 the fiber to the transformer. And where there's a transformer, in that location, we should also leverage on the same infrastructure now to have an internet hotspot. Starting with the markets where our mothers and sisters are domiciled by way of itinerary trade. For purposes of internet connectivity, we have a, a target of 25,000 internet hotspots that we are planned to roll out the 74,000 transformers will enable us almost triple that, our target of, of, of internet hotspots. But eventually, or cumulatively, at the tail end of the exercise, what will happen is that if there is electricity connection, where there is a meter, we should be able to terminate the fiber at the meter. So if there is electricity in any household, we should in equal measure have fiber connectivity to that household. And in corresponding measure, internet to the household. This will be transformational good people because it will enable us undertake e-commerce as opposed to leveraging on the traditional way of doing business from wherever we are. We are also digitalizing government services. When we came into government, we only had 350 services available on the e-citizen platform. As we speak today, we have got a whopping 16,892 services available on the e-citizen platform. Yeah? 16,892 services. The implication is that in the not too distant future, there will no longer be justification for us as government to ask Kenyans to physically visit government offices to consume government services. You should be able to consume government services from the comfort of wherever you are. Yeah? That will facilitate efficiency and effectiveness in service delivery. It will enable us also in equal measure bring in more people into the income bracket. Yeah? And by extension, the tax bracket, we should be able to collect adequate revenue, domestically generated revenue. Would you believe that before we embarked on the digitalization process, we used to collect on average 60 million shillings per day from all sectors of the economy. Today, we are doing between 900 to 1 billion shillings on a daily basis. <laughs> Courtesy of digitalization alone, the sources of revenue remain fundamentally the same. If we pursue this 
to a logical conclusion, we should be able to collect enough domestically generated revenue to sort out our external debt and also have surplus to finance both recurrent and development expenditure. We also encourage you private, as private sector players to digitalize everything. It will drastically enhance your efficiency and re-engineer your operations but, uh, so that you can enhance your profit levels. The other thing we are doing in that space is to train Kenyans. We are starting with the youth, digital scaling. Because if we are rolling out a critical mass of digital infrastructure, but there is no corresponding level of digital skilling among the Kenyan population, then it will be a zero-sum game. So we have embarked on training, starting with the youth. We have started with facilitating this training in TVET. Over the past one year, we have trained 490,000 youth, but in equal measure, we have created 139,000 digital jobs. What we want to do now is to take this program down to the villages. We are working in partnership with the National um, with, the, with the National Assembly, the members of Parliament. They have now already reviewed the CDF Act to the extent that they can now access a threshold of 3% of annual budgetary allocation for CDF funds for purposes of s constructing the basic facilities where we can have the digital hubs. As national government, we are going to connect the internet, we are going to deploy the devices, train the youth for free, not being paid, and connect the youth to global technological companies so that they can get digital jobs from right there in the villages. So we will no longer have the rationale of the youth moving from the rural areas to urban areas in search of white collar jobs which are non-existent. We will create those jobs right there in the village. In each and every ward in this country, we are going to have a digital hub. And I've been instructed by the president to ensure that it is done. It is a performance indicator. And I've got no reason but to deliver on that one. OK? So when you go back home also, ask your local MCA, when are we going to have our digital hub? And let them pursue with the, the members of parliament, because they already have that funding. On my side, I'm ready with connectivity. I'm ready with the devices, just waiting to be tempted to go and deploy. <clears throat> yeah? That will be transformational. We will be able to sort out the unemployment problem in this country. In each hub, we can train 300 people create a corresponding number of jobs. On average, we have got five wards in a constituency. So we can create 1,500 jobs in each constituency. These young men, um, um, uh, boys and girls, are earning on average about 200,000 shillings per month on those digital platforms. 200,000, six months after fourth form. So it's amazing. I know it sounds too good to be true, but those are the facts of the case. We can leverage on technology to transform transform this country. Now, good people, I want to appeal to you as business community, respectable members of the society, society to participate in the forthcoming Nyanza International Investment Conference. A good journey starts with a given step. This conference is a step. Perhaps it is what we have been waiting for, to turn Nyanza into an economic powerhouse. Yeah? Yeah? based on comparative advantages we have in this region. Let us all play our part. Let's put our feet on the deck. Let us participate as delegates. Come in, exhibit your products, take, take the, 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 the exhibition stands, exhibit your products. It could be an opportunity for you. But at the tail end of it also, see it as an opportunity through which you can also get into some <coughs> constructive, tangible, agreements with those investors who are coming from outside. Because those investors will need to work with local partners, isn't it? And who are the local partners? It is you people, isn't it? 